One of the terms that I haven't heard before that you mentioned in your book is transhumanism. Can you talk to me mm -hmm. about that a little bit? Yeah, interesting. Um, so transhumanism is this philosophy centered around uh, the betterment of human beings as individuals and as humanity as a collective. Uh, it's really a, very interesting to me. The only problem with it is that uh, it's mostly just kind of reflecting on what future technologies will give us the ability to do. Right. So they're they're talking about, is it ethical to modify our genes? Would we want to modify our own cognition? Right. Can the human condition actually be enhanced? And in some cases, they're talking about actually extending our life spans or even getting rid of mortality itself. And, and you know, a lot of it does start in the medical world because those are the people who need it most. But it, it also gets interesting when you look at how these advancements will bleed over into uh, what we call normal healthy people's lives right i mean you know what elon musk is trying to do with Neuralink, you know they're putting brain implants into people with the you know idea first of you know improving serious chronic conditions that people have but eventually that's going to be the device that we use to control you know our whole digital world we're going to have these implants in our brain that can create entire realities and we may even be able to actually go through these implants and, and modify our own minds and our own brains in that way. So it, it uh, gets really interesting, but it also gets really uh, scary. There are a lot of ways to misuse these technologies. Uh, so it's, it's going to be an interesting uh, century here. There are a lot of really interesting conversations going on in that space. Um, but again, it's this very futuristic, very hardware focused thing that, that we can all kind of only talk about and do in very small ways. Uh, but to me, you know, I'm really interested in this idea of software transhumanism, right? I think you know, meditation is a great example of what you might call software transhumanism, a way of expanding uh, the, the individual and the human mind beyond what it was necessarily built to be and improving it. And these are all good things, but it, people seem to have a natural proclivity, uh, proclivity to be scared of, of changing the minds. And I just want to ask you, why do you think that is? I think some of it's legitimate. I mean, you, you hear about people's minds getting messed up uh, and it's a, it's a pretty big nightmare. I mean, of all the things to lose in your life, I, I could live with just about anything besides losing my mind. Um, one thing that is important for people to keep in mind, I think, is that although there is a risk in doing these things, modifying your mind, there's also a risk that people are much less inclined to notice. And, and that's a risk of not doing things, right? People, you know, you come across this a lot with psychedelics. People don't want to try, you know, experimenting with, with these drugs that will alter their minds. And it may be very legitimate, you know, it may not be a good idea for you to try these things, but there's also a risk in not trying things that could really enhance your mind. I'm uh, very interested in the biohacking sort of community and movement in general, and the, the neurohacking kind of world that's branched off of it. Um, one of the things I wanted to do in this book is actually take some of that mentality and that community and apply it to the software side rather than the hardware side. So you've got these people geeking over these nootropics and these different chemicals that you can take to optimize your body. It's like, why aren't we geeking over it in the same way, you know, these optimizations that we can make to our minds? Why aren't we looking for wisdom and saying, you know, building communities around saying, well, you can, you can build this idea into your operating system and you can get rid of this emotion or this, you know, cognitive bias, this bad habit. Is that why, do you think Eliezer Yukowski's just got like the, the fattest foundation of the pyramid ever? <laughs> yes, yes, I think so. Um, I've always loved uh, Less Wrong and that whole community. Uh, it's, it's always sort of been one of the, the components of my vision for designing the mind to sort of take that type of community that's so focused on optimization of, of beliefs and biases and apply it to more than just beliefs, apply it to uh, behaviors and, and particularly, I think, emotions, because the same kind of logic applies there. I've always wondered, I, I don't know exactly why there is that 
gap because I look at like the the community centered around biohacking, for example, uh, people taking all these chemicals and psychedelics and injecting themselves with gene altering materials and microchips. Uh, and there's something really cool about it, <laughs> even though it's a uh, there's a bit uh, some some risk there. But uh, I've always wondered why does that community uh, uh, on centered around optimizing your whole psychological software not exist. Um, yeah. And and that's kind of that's kind of where I'm trying to, to come in there. I get it, man. I mean, for anyone that is uninitiated, uh, lesswrong.com and uh, was it overcomingbias.com as well? Was that another one? Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. then Slate Star Codex, which is now Astral Codex 10 or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so all of these different websites are born out of this sort of rationality movement. And if you want to go down a fantastic blog hole, just go and have a little bit of a look because I've I've had I've read some of the best work I've ever, ever seen. Robin Hansen, Eliezer Yukowski, and Scott Alexander are titans, absolute titans. Mm -hmm. And this stuff's just out there. They just do it because they 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 need to write some words on on a page, which is <laughs> unbelievable. But yeah, I would be interested to work out why it is that we don't have that same level of community and and passion around stuff that isn't just rationality. I wonder whether um, it's a bias toward the personality type of the people that go onto those websites, whether they tend to be quite rational, utilitarian, scientific, sort of praying at the altar of science themselves, and that fits in quite easily with their worldview. Whereas if you were to say, okay, now let's talk about how you're actually acting in the real world, or okay, let's actually talk about how your emotions are feeling and uh, doing the metacognizant sort of self-look. Um, I wonder whether that might make it be a step in uh, an uncomfortable direction for, for people. I think that's possible, and I will note that, like, if you really spend time on those blogs, you will see that they are they do pay some attention to those other areas as well. But I think all of it is pretty new. I mean, really, before the internet, you had scholars studying these things, but you didn't have these sort of DIY mind hackers who were all getting together and and trying to optimize themselves. So I think it may just be that it's all kind of new, and that just happens to be the community that that caught on. Yeah, um, but, yeah, that's a good but point. But I think. I think the desire is there. I do think once people see it and can visualize it, they'll they'll want to be a part of that kind of thing. Yeah.